Okay, good afternoon. Today I'm going to speak uh, about study design. This is the second session. So I hope to finish study design today. Uh, but if we, if we cannot, we can continue later, inshallah. I'd like, to, I'd like to start with some questions related to the first presentation. Suppose that we have this design, two groups of patients, smokers and non-smokers. Both groups will be followed up annually by DEXA scan. DEXA scan, it is a type of uh, dual energy X-ray absorptionometry that can diagnose osteoporosis. Uh, to assess the relation of smoking with osteoporosis. This study will end after 10 years. If this is the uh, design, is it case control, cohort study, descriptive study, or cross-sectional studies? If you don't like to interact uh, verbally, please write in the chat your choice, A, B, C, or D. What's your answer? Um, it's a cohort study, B. Why, why TOCA, it, it is cohort study? Uh, the patients were exposed to the risk factors, so they were exposed and they were followed up to, to assess the results after many years. So we have the exposure waiting for the outcome. So um, this is but a prospective we to, study. But we have two groups, so we have two groups. And this is, was not, not inter, uh, interventional study because we don't uh, have a consent uh, to participate in the research and there is no intervention. And we cannot do intervention by smoking because it is uh, harmful. So we just observe patients, sm persons, smokers and non-smokers, that's it. So it is observational. We have two groups and we started with smoking and non-smoking and then the patient uh, the time is longitudinal, uh, starting from today to the uh, uh, tomorrow. So uh, annually, the patients will be evaluated uh, until we reach the end of the expected uh, follow-up period in the study. So it's prospective observational study between two groups. And as Toka mentioned, we started with exposure and non-exposure, and then assessing the occurrence of outcome, which is osteoporosis. If at the end of the study, uh, we will, uh, if we will find that this in smoker groups, uh, osteoporosis is more manifest, this means that smoking is associated with increased risk of osteoporosis. The aim of this study is to answer a question, what will happen to the bones if a person smokes? So it is typical cohort study. Okay, this is an, uh, one of our studies that uh, was published since many years. So this is the, uh, the patient's transthoracic echocardiography examination. This ultrasound of heart was performed for all cases. So we have 73 renal transplant recipients. The effects of clinical, demographic, biochemical, and therapeutic data on echocardiographic parameters were assessed. If this is the design, is it case control, cohort, cross-sectional, or descriptive study? Um, Who wants to answer? I think it might be a cross-sectional study. Why, why cross-sectional study? Because um, we did not change in time. We're just measuring something. It, it's one point of time. Yes, mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. And by ab applying the echocardiogram, echocardiogram can assess cardiac status into affected patients and non-affected patients. In this study, we assessed the hypertrophy of the left ventricle, and we correlated this changes in the muscle of the heart 
with the patient demographics at one point of time. So this, so this, this one point of time, no longitudinal flow up either toward the fu uh, uh, future or toward the past. It is not prospective. It's not retrospective. So the one point of time, uh, so you can see it is prevalence study and it correlated the occurrence of echocardiographic finding with the clinical data in one point of time. So it is cross-sectional study, yes. I think this is the last one in, the, in, the, in these examples. A group of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma were compared to a matched group without hepatocellular carcinoma where the investigators reviewed the files of both groups 14 years back to assess the correlation of hepatocellular carcinoma to previous exposure. What, uh, what is this design? Is it case control, cohort, cross-sectional, or descriptive study? Farah, Farah Jamil. Okay. Toka. Um, uh, case control. Why case control? Um, the study st started with patients having the outcome, which is a cell carcinoma. And then we went, it, so, it was like backward follow up. So it's retrospective. Retrospective study for uh, comparing a group of patients with a well known disease. So disease is known from the start point, which is hepatocellular carcinoma. So we started with a group of patients with a certain outcome, which is hepatocellular carcinoma, and then uh, compared to other group without hepatocellular carcinoma. So the diagnosis of the disease is well known from the start. So diseased persons are case and the control who have no the disease, who have uh, uh, no hepatocellular carcinoma group, uh, the control group, and then the, does, the time is longitudinal toward uh, 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 retrospective, so it is case control study. Perfect. Let us, uh, uh, before, before discussing the rest of the, uh, of the interventional studies, I like to just to, to show you why we are stressing on study design. Because this is the first step to know the evidence. Because according to the power of the study, for adequacy of the study, we can create an evidence-based medicine. And we are living in the era of evidence-based medicine. Although, as I mentioned in the last time, in the era of COVID, still we don't have evidence-based medicine and we treat the patient on a very low level of evidence because this is a very new disease. So if I say case series, I like uh, uh, one of the candidates to just to read the slides. What are the points of strength and the point of weakness? If we know for each design, strength, points of strength and the points of weakness, this is the starting point of building critical brain critical mind, critic, criticism, and the criticism is the base of evidence, base medicine. So uh, I, I like all of the candidates to participate. So uh, uh, anyone wants to uh, share, please read the strengths and weakness of case series. Uh, I can do that. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, okay, so as for the strengths of the case series, we have that it can identify new disease and it shows preliminary studies for uh, that can be used later on for other research. As for the weaknesses, uh, it has no control group and it offers no comparison. So the, uh, 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 if I ask you, uh, the level of evidence based here, is it, uh, it's very low. So we cannot take an evidence-based medicine from a case study, from case report, or even case series. But as you see, it, it is considered a preliminary study and create hypothesis. By the way, all observational studies, even cohort study, 
can be considered as hypothesis generating studies. Okay, so okay. this is the advantages and disadvantages of case series. Case control, yes, you can continue Nadine or Toka because you are very nice and very active. <laughs> so you, you can read in, uh, intermittently. Do, uh, Toka? Yes, Toka. Um, okay, the strength for the case control study, it's quick and cheap. It's convenient and it's good for rare diseases. Whereas yes. it's based on recall, it has, um, it has confounders, which um, it's a variable that's unaccounted for. And it's difficult to choose control groups. Perfect. So do you know the, what's meant by confounder? Um, I think that, that the research is based on two variables, for example, and then uh, there's an, a variable that's unaccounted for that may affect the results. Perfect. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain it after the cohort study. Nadine, uh, what are the strengths and weakness of cohort study? Um, okay, as for the strengths, uh, it helps in observing patients and it shows a prospective kind of study. Um, that's a point in the future. As for the weaknesses, it's time consuming. It, um, it has many confounders that are unaccounted for and it cannot prove uh, a causation. So it has possible, possible confounders because mm -hmm. it is one step above case control study because mm -hmm. we are following the patient longitudinally, but again, we cannot prove causation from any observational study, but it creates hypothesis and they generate hypothesis. And one of the advantages of a case control and a cohort study is they are best fitting when we want to address or assess harm because it's very difficult and it's it maybe unethical to do interventional study to prove harm. Okay? So this is an example of what's meant by confounder, as mentioned by Nadine and Toka. We may have hidden factor, a hidden risk factor that is associated with the outcome. But I, uh, I assume that the exposure under assessment is the cause. So for example, this is one of the important studies and the best example, it is cohort study. In this study, uh, uh, the number of people included were more than 600,000. So it's a big number of patients or persons. And they, uh, uh, in, they include, included males and females, large number. And then the exposure here, drinking coffee. So the persons are either uh, don't, didn't drink coffee or drinking coffee, one cup, two cup, three cup, four cup, five cup, according to their uh, habit. And then the question, uh, suppose that we will drink coffee. Does drinking coffee uh, cause mortality? This was the question. So if you look here carefully, uh, look at the results and uh, just a second. So if you look here at this uh, table uh, that shows age adjusted hazard ratio. I know that you are still in the beginning. When you see one, this age adjusted hazard ratio, this means that there is no difference between both groups. So uh, uh, the uh, drinking coffee group and non-drinking are the same because adjusted hazard is one. If it is above one, this means that the risk is increased. But to say it is significant is a very simple, just simple data. What is present between brackets is confidence interval. To say 1.02 is significant, here we should be above one. So long as we cut one, so the here 0.9 to 1.07, this means that we are cutting one, so this is insignificant associated with increased mortality. And here, what do you see here, uh, Nadine? Here, the, the adjusted hazard ratio of mortality because of drinking six cups of coffee is 1.6. Do you see the confidence in interval? 
yes. It is 1.5. This means it is above one. Doesn't mm -hmm. cut one. If it cut one below one and above one, this means that no significant difference between the two groups. Just a very simple idea. So here, mortality is increased by uh, approximate 60% in the persons who drink six cup of coffee or more. And the confidence between 1.5 to 1.7, this means that it is significant. If we take it here, this is for men. And for women, it is the same drinking uh, from, from this point, because here the confidence doesn't cut one. So it is above one, it is significant. 13% if we drink four cup of coffee, and above six cup of coffee mortality increased by 50%. And this is the range, confidence interval above one. If we take the results of the coffee drinking and the mortality, we can say that increased number of cups of coffee a, a drink per day increase mortality for both men and women. Am I right? Yes. But look at the rest of the analysis. What? what when, when we take the results like this, we can uh, go to the television and saying, please don't drink uh, a lot of coffee. But when they uh, did adjustment for smoking, because some of coffee drinkers smoke as well, because this is the habit to drink coffee and yeah. smoke. So uh, we, here we adjusted for age, so we should adjust for other factors. One of the other factors is smoking. Look at the data here. When we adjust for smoking, what happened? This is the hazards of no drinking. Uh, one, what happens? The hazard risk of mortality is reduced. And here from the early beginning, from one cup of coffee, it is less than one. So long as it doesn't cut one, this means it's significant. But here it's a significant lower mortality. So drinking coffee uh, saves life based on after uh, doing the adjustment of smoking. Even six cups of coffee, the hazards of mortality is 0.9, less than one, and it doesn't cut one, the confidence interval. This means that coffee drinking is protective for the life for men and the same for women. Look here, this is before adjustment of smoking and this is after uh, the, uh, uh, avoiding the effect of smoking. So drinking coffee based on this cohort of study, we can say coffee drinking is not associated with mortality, but what is associated with mortality is smoking. So smoking here, uh, here in this example is a real confounder. Do you get it? Now clear? And this is a problem that even if we do adjustment because in the statistics, there is what is known multivariate analysis to adjust for multiple factors. But sometimes the, we have factors that we don't know. So how, how to adjust what we don't know? It, it, it will be very difficult. And this is the real problem of all observational studies, that confounders are there. And to uh, uh, be sure of this point. Uh, can anyone give me an example, another example of confounder? Do you know other example? If Maybe. I say... Yes, please. Diet, please Nadine. Something that has to do with the diet. Maybe if we're like looking at the um, uh, the risk of having uh, a myocardial infarction, for, for an example, and then we just look at the subjects that we have, and we do not take into account the diet that they are taking. So, so if we, uh, so it, you can apply this example for anything. Mm -hmm. You want to correlate exposure to certain. Uh, uh, toxins, so environmental exposure, and occurrence of any outcome, you can find 
hidden confounder. Uh, another very clear example, if we, if we, if obesity is associated with increased cardiovascular death. If, if this is the study, obese and non-obese, and then assessing mortality. And then when we put diabetes, uh, and then we find only diabetic obese patients uh, die. This means that diabetes is confounder. This is why we should assess uh, multiple factors when we uh, think of validity of the observational studies. Another example, uh, study correlates drinking uh, alcohol and lung cancer. So the alcohol drinkers and non-alcohol drinkers and the patients, both groups were f uh, followed up for a period of time and then they found that alcoholics are associated with increased risk of lung cancer. And when they adjust for smoking, they found uh, no significant difference. So smoking, uh, because some of alcoholics uh, smoke as well. So always think of the confounders. Do you know how to get rid of confounders? Who knows this, the answer of this question? I'll give him a gift <laughs> after, after Corona vanish. <laughs> Do you know how to get rid of confounders? Mm. Doctora Rasha Kamal, do you know how to how to uh, get rid of confounders? Uh, doctor, maybe we can eliminate those with the, with the present confounders. How to eliminate? How to eliminate confounders? Yes. So for example, and for example, if we have alcohol drinkers and smokers, so we can have only, you know, ask people who only smoke. No, don't don't, don't to concentrate on the example that I mentioned. It's, it's, uh, I say in general, how to be sure that confounders are not there by another, um, another language, which design we, can, we should follow to avoid confounders. Multivariate analysis? No. Multivariate in or observational study, be, uh, we will, or will adjust. Uh, yes, uh, we'll, yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm going to. Randomized controls. So the one of one of the advantages of doing a randomized controlled study, uh, especially if the study includes a large number of patients, because the power of randomized controlled study, as I am going to mention, is dependent on number of patients. So if we have large randomized controlled study and we do randomization, so the confounders are equally distributed among both groups if we have large number of patients. This is why before running any randomized control study, we should calculate the number of patients uh, uh, that should be included in the study, okay? So if I have large number of patients included in randomized control study, this is one of the best ways to avoid confounders. Why? Because confounders in this large randomized control study will be equally distributed. Because an observational study, we can say, we will put a number of patients who are obese in this group, like this group. Diabetic here, like here. Uh, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, uh, heavy calorie diet, exposed to pollution. So we can, we can write many factors and then uh, to uh, 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 allow the, the two groups to be equal in these uh, factors. But at the end of the day, there may be factors that we don't know now, and they may be known in the future. And th these factors can also uh, 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 interplay with the results that we have. So confounders uh, are a big problems in the observational studies in general. Is it clear? Um, I see a doctor asking okay. um, by saying that in uh, by randomization uh, we leave an equal chance for the any confounders collected that equally distributed in a very large number yes. of people. Yani, does that mean in nana magi ahsabha statistically have a confounder effect of that non significant? No confounders because confo uh, uh, um, your question is very nice. Why? But, but I'm going to explain it in a randomized control study. 
one of the most important pages in the results of randomized control study is to read the demographic criteria uh, written in the first page. Usually we put demographic criteria like age, gender, body weight, diabetes, hypertension, hepatitis, uh, ATC. There are a list of data that we are assuming that uh, this uh, data can interfere uh, with the results. So this table shows clearly that both groups are homogeneous. So if we have a, a large number of patients distributed equally one-to-one -one in two arms by randomization, and then we find the demographics of the patients are equal, this means that we are, the randomization is valid. But if we do randomized control study, including a few number of patients, really, really confounders may be there as well. Okay? So it is a matter of chance. chance. But uh, this is why, uh, if I say to you, instead of doing randomization, uh, we can use other ways, like known as quasi. Quasi means semi-randomization. Like, we'll include in the first arm of the study all patients born in the first half of the year. We'll include, uh, so under the other group will be the second half of the year. Is it randomization? No. We'll include in the first arm patients who will come to the outpatient clinic on Saturday, Sun Monday, uh, Wednesday, and the other Sunday, Tuesday, uh, Thursday in the second group. It is not randomization. So randomization means randomization. I'm going to explain this in the randomization process. Okay? Before I'm going to explain intervention studies because I stopped at the intervention studies and randomization in the last session, uh, I would like to, uh, to discuss with you the end points of any study to be done. For end point of the study, we have big, uh, two big categories. We have solid outcome and we have very good end points. What's meant by very good end points, Toka? Or Omar? Well, um, I have no idea, sir. What's meant by surrogate in the book? Surrogate, surrogate in Arabic means il badil. Uh, to use certain end point instead of the hard end point. What is the hard end point? Hard end points, as I mentioned the last time, is either the patient death or organ death. So if I'm speaking about kidney, Either patient dies or kidney dies. What's meant by kidney dies? The patient needs dialysis or transplantation. So this is in the stage kidney disease. Is it, is, it, is it clear? So this is solid outcome. But as you know, if we wait until patient dies or in the stage kidney disease occurs, this will take very, very long time. How to wait 20 years to assess certain factors, it's very difficult to be run in any study. This is why scientists and doctors always search for the valid and respected surrogate in the bone. Surrogate means to be used instead of the solid one. As I mentioned in Arabic, al badil. Uh, so uh, in, in renal failure, instead of waiting until kidney fails, we can use a changes of proteinuria. Because we assume that if proteinuria increases, this will be associated with increased risk of uh, future renal failure. So if the if proteinuria level is reduced, this is a good point. If proteinuria level is increased, this is a bad point. For cardiology, and instead of uh, uh, following patients until myocardial infarction occurs, we can assess the changes of lipid, this lipidemia occurrence of this lipidemia, and instead of that. So for each disease and for each system, uh, you will find researchers using the uh, uh, end points that can be used. So if you look here, the solid outcome for kidney is occurrence of kidney failure. This is the most respected end point. The same patient die. This is, both of them are the most important and solid outcome criteria. But here we uh, accustom the nephrology research 
and in interventional studies in nephrology to use the surrogate endpoints like doubling of serum creatinine. So if creatinine now is one and becomes a two, this means that is significant outcome. If we wait for a, very, a longer period of time, we will have renal failure at the end of the day. So uh, another end point, decline of glomerular filtration rate by 40% or 30% or a changes of urine albumin creatinine ratio or protonuria. So all these are known as surrogate end points. So again, solid end point means either ba patient or organ uh, death, organ death means organ failure, uh, the surrogate end points for each system, uh, uh, there is the uh, agreed upon surrogate end points in nephrology, as I mentioned, changes of protonuria, changes of GFR, changes of creatinine can be used and instead of waiting a long time uh, to witness renal failure or patient death. In the last week, we discussed together the type of intervention studies and they were classified into animal and human, and human intervention studies were classified into non-control. This means we don't have control, and this is a weak point. So all patients consented to participate in research, and all of them received the intervention. This is non-controlled human intervention studies. Then, according to the presence of control, we have historical control. In historical control, we compare the results of uh, the uh, uh, patients who are subjected to the intervention to previous cohort of patients uh, for whom we have their, uh, their results. Sequential, either to control the patient against him or herself, so uh, like fatigue score, before and after treatment, depression score, pain score, so this is before and after in the same patient. Or crossover study, and in crossover study, it is used in pharmacological treatment as the, we have two groups, each group is, uh, uh, rece uh, received a uh, certain intervention in the first phase, and before receiving medicine or intervention, uh, both groups uh, are evaluated. Then after a period of time, and before finishing the first phase, we evaluate the patients regarding the end points that we are assessing, and then stopping both medications for five half-lives, usually two weeks, and then in the second, uh, before starting the second phase, we assess both groups, and then the, uh, uh, we make cross between interventions, and then to reevaluate again in the second phase. And if the results are homogeneous uh, in the first and second phases, give uh, a bonus point. I explained this in the last uh, time. Then we stopped at the uh, uh, concurrent, interventional human studies and concurrent means that we have two parallel groups. We have control group and interventional group. And uh, I should ask myself, uh, is there a randomization process or not? If we just select the patients, come here and this, uh, this patient's uh, assigned for me to have the control group, signed to be in the intervention group, here I selected the patients, so there is selection bias. And this is why the best uh, 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 benefit of the randomization is to so solve and neutralize selection bias. And this is one of the uh, preferred MCQ questions. What is the merit or advantage of randomization is to avoid selection bias. How randomization process, uh, process is done, this is what I'm going to explain now. Usually, we have two methods of randomization, either closed envelope or computer-generated order. What's meant by closed envelope? Do you know what's meant by closed envelope? Any, like assigning the uh, subjects to different groups without, without, uh, you know, without anyone knowing about it? To avoid the bias يعني, in her research here to know which patient is taking which drug, and our patient knowing? Uh, in randomization, it is, it is not the patient knowing. It is the how the patient is selected to each arm of the study. Suppose that we have two arms of the study, and we, 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 uh, we don't like 
to intentionally select a patient in, in an arm. Because if you say to, if you give me money to prove the efficacy of, and safety of the drug, then I can display if, if there is no randomization, so I can select the demographics that lead to certain results, okay? So uh, how to use close the envelope? The first step is for randomization is to cal calculate, there is a formula, uh, and the formula uh, between, uh, between us and the, the statistic, uh, statistical uh, experts uh, uh, to assess the, uh, the number of patients uh, that should be included in the study. So I say the sample size is 100 or 1,000 patients. So and the, the randomization process is run one to one. And before doing the randomization, so the first step is to calculate the number of patients included in the study. Uh, number two, to say the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Suppose that I want to say uh, uh, the dr drugs that prevent acute rejection in renal transplantation. So I should write in the randomization process, this study is done in, for patients who received their first renal transplant because uh, the patient may fail after transplantation. They, they need second and third transplant. So we'll say by this way, we, we can say in exclusion criteria patients who are transplanted for the second or the third time. Uh, the young patients uh, below 18 years or above 65 years old patients are excluded. So the study includes middle-aged. Uh, uh, the females shouldn't be pregnant and they should be on a contraceptive method. So all these are inclusion and prerequisites. So when I determine the number of patients to be included and then the ratio of randomization one to one, and the third one, inclusion and exclusion criteria. If there is no exclusion and there is inclusion criteria, so the patient is uh, included in the study. How close the envelope, uh, how we use close the envelope? Uh, suppose that the number of patients is 100. So, and the randomization is one to one. So 50 patients who should be labeled as control and 50 patients should be labeled as uh, interventional group. Then what we do, for each envelope, we put the label inside the envelope and we close the envelope in an opaque manner, like what we do in the, in the, in the written exam. There is, uh, in the control of the uh, exam, there is a, an opaque, the, to, not to see the number, serial number of the student. Here, the same, the, it is closed and opaque. Uh, because I, we, don't, we don't like the investigator or researcher to know the, what is inside the label. So we have 50 envelope. Inside each envelope, there is the, this is control, 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 control. So 50 control, 50 intervention. And after, be sure that we have 100 divided into one to one, what we do, we mix the envelope like this in a random way. In Arabic, they kurshena. And after doing this, we arrange them from 1 to 100. So the, 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 uh, then we have a patient who is fitting inclusion without exclusion criteria. Then we go and withdraw an envelope. And after opening the envelope, we find this patient should be in certain arm. We follow the envelope. And in a respected place, in respected places, they put, so the, before opening the label, they put the patient name and file number on the envelope to be sure that the patient is included in this arm. So this is the way how close the envelope is done, close the envelope process. If we finish 100 patients, the patients uh, included in the study, by the end of the study, will be uh, uh, equally distributed among the two groups. Because we uh, make random uh, allocation of the envelopes, we can, sell, we can uh, uh, look at the, uh, the first and second division, find them in, the, in one of the arms. Uh, 
ان ارابيك انا لما يكون عاوز 100 عاوز 100 فيبقى و... وانا قايل ان الراندومايزيشن 1 تو 1 فيبقى 50 هنا و50 هنا هحط 50 ليبل في 50 ظرف والظرف مش عارف جواه ايه يبقى 50 اهم و50 اهم الاثنين ايكوال اقوم هلخبطهم على بعض بعنف كده وبعد كده ملخبطهم ارصهم ممكن ممكن ما اجي اسحب الاولاني الا كنترول اسحب الثاني الا كنترول اسحب الثالث الا كنترول لان هي لما اتلخبطت عملت كده فممكن تمشي واحد لواحد واحد لاثنين بس في النهايه لما اخلص ال 100 عيان هيبقوا ايكوال ديستريبيوتد ان بوث جروبس از ات كلير ناو؟ اه تمام يا دكتور Computer generated order. It is an order done by computer. So computer will allocate by the computer program the the number, the patient number one, three, seven, eleven. So it is haphazard selection done by the computer, and we follow it. Sometimes to be to be done in a in a very professional way. There is some. Uh, companies and some authorities or some investigators follow distance allocation. What's meant by distance allocation? By using computer or telephone, and then you, you, you just uh, uh, go through the program and then saying, I am, I am Hussein, I, am, I have a patient now which is fit with the study inclusion and he has no exclusion, then I'll be asked the name, file number, some uh, uh, data, and then, then uh, I receive this patient should be in arm, so on, so on, so. And the statistics at the end of the study will be done according to what I received from the system. So this is a way of randomization. We exhaust ourselves to avoid selection bias because selection bias may be one of the most important confounder that uh, display that uh, uh, destroy the uh, result of interventional study is it clear so the best study design to improve drug efficacy and safety is randomized control study the uh, uh, type of bias which is neutralized by randomization is selection bias and this is how the uh, study is conducted. We have a big sample of patients. Patients will be allocated into two arms, treated and control group. And then we follow them according to the methodology of follow-up until we reach the end. So the end may be uh, one year follow-up, maybe five year follow-up, maybe occurrence of certain end points like in kidney transplantation until the first rejection, for example. So according to the end point, uh, written in the study design, uh, we assess uh, the patient and follow the patient. At the end of the study, we do statistics to see the impact of intervention or the effect of intervention. Type of control in the randomized control study, we have sham. What's meant by sham, Nadine? Um, I think it's like mimicking the whole process that we would usually do with a subject without giving the actual drug or can you give me, can you give me an example of sham um is, I it, is it the type of control uh, in human studies or in animal study animal study i think it's it is usually it is usually done in animal study because for example uh, uh, when we perform a schema reperfusion injury model in rats then we can open the rat just open the rat and close the rat. Nothing, no touch to the kidney or the renal pelvis or the vessels. Mm -hmm. And this is sh sham group, just open the rat, uh, holding the artery like this and then closing the rat, nothing. So mm -hmm. here we don't, don't do anything, okay? Yes. So, uh, so it is a sham. Uh, 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 why sham is needed in animal studies? Because uh, uh, we wanted to neutralize the effect of anesthesia and, and wound. Mm -hmm. Because suppose that we have ischemia reperfusion, reperfusion injury model. This means that we both clamp on the, uh, on the uh, renal artery and then removing one kidney and then after 45 minutes we release the clamp. So the kidney becomes ischemic and then 
exposed to a reperfusion injury. This is, if we do the experiment in this fashion, this is the positive control group. If we treat the positive control group, it will be treated group. And to have negative control group, negative control group for a ischemia reperfusion injury model, we should open the rat, then removing one of the kidneys without putting clamp on the other, uh, on the other kidney. So here we do intervention, we do nephrectomy. And then CHAM means we don't do nephrectomy at all, we don't interfere with the blood supply of the kidney. So what is the value of all these control? Uh, we uh, would like to establish the full program of ischemic refusion injury. Uh, this is the positive control. And then we can apply any intervention, any treatment to assess the efficacy of this treatment on ischemic refusion injury. But to be sure, we should have negative control because you can say to me, this is because of nephrectomy. So I should uh, nullify the effect of nephrectomy by including a negative control group. And then you can say, this is because of anesthesia and skin wound. So I should have CHAM group. So CHAM group, it is the group of rats where I don't do anything. My question to you, can you imagine CHAM in human studies? It'd be a bit unethical. <laughs> it is impossible to open the, uh, the, uh, the abdomen of the patient and then close the abdomen of the patient. It is, uh, it is not like this. But uh, there are, there are uh, some uh, interventional human sham uh, controlled studies. One example is uh, what is the effect of ischemia uh, delayed uh, if I bought the sphygma, if I want to assess the effect of distal limb ischemia on the internal organ ischemia, because there is assumption if we do ischemia of the arm, it can alleviate ischemia of the heart or ischemia of the organs, okay? So if I bought here, how to create ischemia of the limb is by putting a sphygma cuff here and raise the pressure within the cuff above systolic blood pressure. If I raise uh, the pressure above systolic blood pressure, what will happen? Circulation of the limb will be occluded completely. This is ischemia. How to do it in a sham group? Because uh, you can find a person who says that <coughs> the effect is not because you occlude the circulation, but the effect is because you put a cuff and you inflate the cuff on the arm. So we include sham group, in sham group patients, we put the cuff of the sphygmometer and there is a, the pressure inside the cuff, but not to the extent to occlude the circulation. By this way, it is sham group. Do you understand now? Yes. Is it clear? So here, the cuff is put on the arm, but in the active group, the ischemia was created, and in the uh, sham group, no ischemia because we don't increase pressure above systolic blood pressure. Then the, uh, the, may, the, the most famous uh, types of control is the gold standard. If we want to prove any new intervention uh, for either therapeutic or diagnostic efficacy, we should control the new intervention to the gold standard that is, is known. For example, for treatment before uh, in, the, in the era of interferon, treatment of hepatitis C was, uh, the standard was interferon and ribavirin. After 2014, it, is, it changed into the newer treatment, which are direct antiviral drug against hepatitis C. Before, uh, before shifting to direct antiviral drug, they should be compared to the all the gold standard. So to, to, to accept new modality of treatment, we should compare the results of the new modality to the old one. If it is the same, but cheaper intervention, we can say it's good because price is important. Less invasive is very nice because invasive intervention is also uh, means, means a lot. So if the new intervention is equal, but less in price or less in invasion, this will, uh, will accept it as gold standard treatment. 
uh, and if you find it is superior even to the old one, so it, it will be the newer gold standard treatment. Before agreeing on the newer gold standard treatment, we should compare its results to the older, older one. Diagnostic. For example, the gold standard diagnostic test for, for renal fibrosis is renal biopsy. If I say to you, I have a new urinary testing, so I can test urine by uh, regarding uh, factor X, and this is well, this means fibrosis. So I should compare it to renal biopsy results before uh, accepting it as a gold standard. A stone of the kidney, a spiral CT is a gold standard test. If I say ultrasound can replace CT, I should compare the results of ultrasound to CT scan. If I say in, in hepatology, Nadine, do you know uh, uh, what is done today to prove uh, cirrhosis? Uh, biopsy. <laughs> the gold standard is biopsy. This was in the past. Nowadays, uh, there is a, 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 they tended to use non-invasive testing like fibroscan and ultrasound by elastigraphy to replace the invasive nature of biopsy. So always uh, we search for non-invasive testing and to agree about its efficacy in diagnosis, we should compare the results of the newer a diagnostic tool to the gold standard one. And then placebo. What's meant by placebo? Omar, Omar Ayman. Muhammad Amr. Muhammad uh, Amr. Yes. Uh, What's meant by placebo? Uh, placebo effect is, is like something like a, a tablet or any something that usually has a medical effect, but in the placebo doesn't have a medical effect. It's just like um, psychological. Why we need placebo? Uh, because sometimes you, uh, in the short AC exam, we can say what are the criteria of placebo. Do you know what, is, what are the criteria of placebo? No, I don't know. Placebo should be a phantom. Uh, like the original, like the interventional drug, in in what in shape. So if the interventional drug is tablet, so placebo should be tablet. Capsule, capsule. Vial, vial. So it should be the same in form. Sh should be same in color. Should be same in odor. Should be same in test. Everything. It is typically a copy of the original one. Except, except it doesn't contain active material to test for the active material. Because, as you mentioned, from psychological point of view, if you take care of the patient and giving him just, if the patient by psychosocial, so long psychosomatic, if he is receiving a tablet, and he put in mind to, that tablet means uh, that he can be cured from the disease. He can be cured because he received only medicine. And the active in, in material within this drug is nothing. How to know it is nothing? We should uh, measure it against placebo. So if the patient receives, this is uh, 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 in a funny way, that when we do MCQ questions for MD nephrology group, uh, uh, as assignment in MSQ quiz. Uh, I go while um, uh, closing my eye and then click on the answer without reading the questions. And then if I give uh, if my score at the end of the exam is 20%, this means any student uh, who uh, will have this score, this means he know nothing, just by chance. But, uh, so this is this is why we should test medicine against uh, placebo. And uh, using placebo in medicine is, uh, get, uh, is recommended for evidence-based medicine. Uh, sometimes it is difficult to accept placebo in certain situations like COVID-19 uh, disease, but 
uh, I, I think there are ongoing trials using placebo plus standard of care plus certain intervention, so intervention against placebo. So the, the only way to prove drug efficacy by the highest standard of evidence is to, be, to test the medicine against placebo. Okay, is it clear? So placebo means the proposed or expected beneficial effect of the drugs. Do you know the reverse of placebo? Toka or Nadine? What is the, the reverse of placebo? <laughs> the opposite of placebo, and this is very important, uh, nocebo. What's meant by nocebo? It is the opposite of placebo. Uh, I don't understand anything. You can say to me, I don't understand anything. What's meant by opposite placebo? Opposite placebo means uh, uh, and the patients can read in the media uh, or in the internet side effects of certain drugs. So if you go to the patient and saying we will give you certain drug and this drug will cause diarrhea, will cause muscle ache, because the patient is concentrating on the side effects, the patient may report side effect of the drug while it is because of neurological and not because of the side effect, real side effect, okay? How to get rid of nocebo and placebo? This will be explained in the masking and randomized control study. Again, randomization means a process to avoid selection bias. And then the types of randomized control trials are either open label, single blind, double blind, or triple blind. Do you know what the difference between open, single, double blind, triple blind? Toka? Um, an open label, both the patient and the doctor, or the, uh, the both, both, both of them know, know the, um, the drug that they're taking, or the, uh, any, okay. let's say, how it is. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, the, the doctor is the one who knows? Single blind the, doctor knows, but the patient doesn't know. Double yes. blind? They both don't know. So what is the value of blinding? To uh, reduce bias, I think. To which type of bias is reduced here? Because selection is avoided by the process of randomization. And all these methods of, uh, uh, if the study follows any of the masking process of all these, all of them are randomized control study. What is the what is what, which type of bias is avoided here? If we I do confirmation if we, bias, excuse me, confirmation bias on. I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't um, hear. Eliminating like um, in, in the double blinding, we kind of eliminate the confirmation bias so that the what's doctor. Meant to, what's meant to be confirmation bias? It's like. When, when you want something to be proven right. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm going to explain. So uh, do you uh, remember nocebo, which is the patient is aware by side effects of the drug. So if you say to him, the, this is the nature of the drug, then he will report the symptoms. If we follow single blind, this will ameliorate nocebo effect. So nocebo effect, is avoided by single and double blinding because both of them, uh, uh, the patient doesn't know the nature of the drug given, okay? Then open label and double blind because doctor in open label and a single blind is, uh, knows well the type of intervention taken. Is it the intervention active or the control group? But in double blind, the physician doesn't know if the uh, intervention is the active one or the control. What, uh, what the, the value of this point? Suppose that I am doing an open label study. All doctors and physicians and all researchers, if they are young, 
becomes more enthusiastic, even if they don't have, if they don't get money from companies, they are enthusiastic to prove that their interventions or intervention under testing is beneficial uh, to uh, feel that they do important issue. So they, they will be more energetic when they know the intervention. Suppose I, I'm going to give you an example. My PhD degree, my MD nephrology uh, internal medicine degree, uh, uh, my thesis was to test efficacy and safety of one of uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies to prevent rejection in the induction. So I know well that this patient receives the monoclonal antibody under testing, and the second the patient receives nothing. So I know the patient who received the intervention. And we put the, in the criteria of follow-up, if creatinine increases, serum creatinine increases by 0.2 milligram per deciliter, graft biopsy, biopsy should be done. So if, if this is my patient who received the intervention and the creatinine increases by 0.2, then what I can do? I'll say to the patient, drink, please drink more water and we will repeat uh, tomorrow creatinine. But if the patient in the control arm, I'll do biopsy immediately. By this way, is it a bias or not, Nadine? Um, I think it is. <laughs> it is bias. Which type of bias here I'm speaking about? Um, it is follow-up or performance, performance bias. Mm -hmm. So to uh, be sure that the doctor uh, deals with both arms, because in double blind, he doesn't know if this patient in the active or in the control group. So we will apply the protocol. There will no display with the protocol. So this is, this avoid double blinding is the method of randomization of the masking that avoid performance bias. And this is also one of preferred MSQ questions. Which type of bias is avoided by randomization is selection which type of bias is avoided by double blinding, it is performance or follow-up bias. Does single blinding, just the patient is not aware by the nature of intervention given, uh, uh, does it help? Does it have any advantage over open label? Yes, it avoids the nocebo effect. So both single blind and double blind masking neutralizes and solves the problem of nocebo. Double blind uh, uh, neutralizes performance bias. Triple blind is, it is a method of double blind, but here, if the study is done among many centers, and then we have uh, coordinators, coordinators are not uh, uh, aware by the nature of the study. So here I want to ask you a question. If the study is run by the masking of double blind, which is the best, the best way. So this is why if there is an article, including the, uh, the methodology is double blind randomized control study, you will find in the title of the article, it is the most spicy uh, part of the study. The perfect design is double blind randomized control trial if it includes a large number of patients. Because the power of the study, and this is one of the important points, the power of the study is dependent on sample size. The larger the number of patients included in the randomized control study, the higher the power of the study. The lower the number of the patient, the lower the power of the study. And this will create errors in statistics. Uh, and I'm, going not, not, I'm not going to bother you by the detailed statistics. Is it clear now? Okay. So this is one of the studies. This is just to, 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 yeah, to, to, uh, to show you an example of randomized control study. This is, by the way, this is one of the uh, randomized control trial that is published in the issue of the New England Journal of Medicine today. Because every Thursday, there is a, a new issue of New England jo Journal of Medicine. So this is multinational. Multinational, this means the study is done on a different demographics, and this give a bonus for the any randomized control study. Randomized investigator initiated open label. Open label. This means that investigator and the patients, both of them, know the nature of the 
intervention given. I'm not, I'm not going to concentrate on the type of intervention, but here, this is oral abixaban, which is uh, direct oral anticoagulant, and this is uh, uh, delta heparin. It is low molecular weight heparin. This is an oral drug, and this is injection. And so by default, uh, this is not a placebo. This is open label and not placebo. Why not placebo? Because the uh, both intervention are uh, different in shape and form. This is an oral and this is injection. So it should be an open label, no way. Uh, this is a question. If the study is run by double blind like this study, double blind, who knows the, uh, in, the nature of intervention? If both treating physician and the patient, both of them don't know the nature of intervention given, who knows? Nadine? Um, maybe like uh, a senior supervisor who has nothing to do with the operation. For each, for each uh, study, for each protocol, we have uh, the principal investigator or BI. BI means principal investigator. He is not, he is not the person who, care, who uh, conducted the study, but he is supervised and he is the man behind the idea but he is not the person who gives medicine to the patients. But he knows well what is meant by if the, if the drug is given in a code. This is, for example, XL17AB, and the other is another code. He knows what, what the code means. Why, why we should have a person who knows the, uh, the, the active material and the nature of the of the intervention given. <laughs> because uh, uh, sometimes we are obliged to stop the study. Because the patient safety is superior to any research. So if the patient will be uh, affected by the outcome, if, the, if, if you do a study and you, you find in one of the arms of the study, there is excessive excess reports of side effects, major side effects or mortality. We should stop the study immediately. And if we stop the study immediately and the code should be breached and the analysis is done. If we find that the harm is in the intervention group, this is in English considered the nail in the coffin. What's meant by nail in coffin, Nadine? Do you mean in English? No, I'm not saying that 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 i am يعني مسمار في نعشه يعني جاب دولف يعني يبقى very difficult to be, to be tested again so for safety reasons the uh, code should be breached to know uh, this is a study uh, known as credence study to test this drug for treating diabetes and they put the renal outcome as primary end point and this was one of the the first study in its nature to use anti-diabetic drug because this is one of the anti-diabetic drug and the outcome is not uh, cardiovascular or glycemia. The primary endpoint is deterioration of the kidney function. So it is double blind, randomized controlled study so the design is perfect. Each arm including more than 2000 patients. So this is large number a high of, of respected power. So this is one of the, this is one of the, by the way, it is one of landmark studies done in diabetes and in nephrology because the study was premature terminated. So if we, if we find certain outcome that is very significant in, 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 the, in the patient who report many, we should breach the code to know which group 
is affected. Here, this is one of the very rare studies that were premature terminated because of beneficial effects obtained by the drug. It is good news for the company or bad news, Nadine? Uh, bad news. No good news because the drug is effective to reduce renal failure, uh, well, to reduce well, protonuria, beneficial effects. The harmful effects were in the placebo. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, so, so, if the, so after breaching the code, we'll know, is it in the active or in placebo? If it is in the active arm, this is a bad because the drug under assessment uh, is associated with major side effects. But if the, if the major side effects are in placebo, this means that the active intervention reduces the bad outcome. This means the drug is magic. So this is one of the landmark studies in nephrology that paved the way for this drug to be used in renal patients because it reduces the renal uh, outcome and the saves kidneys in diabetic patients. So this is premature termination by good news, not bad news, okay? So again, if the, if the study is run by double blind uh, randomized control study, which is the best design, especially if it includes large number of patients, the study should be completed until the end of the protocol, except if there is excess problems, the code should be breached and then to evaluate if the side effects are in the intervention or the control group. If it's in the placebo group, this is a, this is a magnificent drug. If it's in the interactive, uh, in the intervention group, it is bad drug. Okay. And this is just to show you what's meant by nocebo that I just explored. Nocebo means side effect of the drug. If I take a drug that I'm aware of its side effects, I'm going to report side effects more and more. How to prove it? This is what I mentioned to you. If I want to neutralize nocebo, uh, I should follow either single blind or double blind technique. And this is, a, this is what happened here in this study. And when statin, do you know statins, in, uh, Nadine? Uh, all lipid lowering agents? Yes. Uh, it is famous by certain side effect, which is toka. What is the most important side effect of statin? Is muscle ache, myalgia, or muscle intolerance. If I say to the patient, this is a statin, and the statins causes muscle ache, what do you expect? After taking the drug, the patient will start to say, I have muscle ache. So this is what happened. If they test the statin against the uh, uh, placebo and then against the in double blind fashion, they found, although it is statin, but there was excess reverse of muscle ache in open label. Because in open label, patient, no, patient knows well this is statin, okay? Is it clear? So how to, avo how to avoid nocebo? by following single blind or double blind technique. Could you tell me, What's your so, okay. Yes, both of them because the patient is not aware uh, by the drug uh, given. Okay? And the doctor is the only person who is aware by the nature of the drug. So long as the patient doesn't know the nature of the drug, is it the intervention, the active one or the control? He doesn't know, is it the active or the control? Then this, is, this uh, regarding nocebo, it is the same like single and double blind. So to, again, the best randomized control the study is the study that included a large number of patients uh, run in double blind uh, uh, placebo randomized control or double blind randomized control study. So the best is double blind randomized control trial done in large number of patients. This is just a break. If this is the, uh, this is one of my publications uh, since a long time, since 14 years, the long term evaluation of bezleximab. This is a drug that uh, reduces interplay with interleukin 2. It's, so it's monoclonal antibody. Using induction therapy means at the time of transplantation, 
Uh, so long-term evaluation of bezalixumab induction therapy in live donor kidney transplantation, a five-year prospective randomized study. Toka. And I'm, I'm going to ask Toka and Nadine because nobody wants to, uh, to, to interact with me. Omar? If Omar wants, I'll be happy. Omar Ayman or Muhammad Amr. Muhammad. Okay, uh, if I ask you, uh, remove one word of the title that doesn't affect the title. So which word you will, you, you will be, uh, you will select. So which, select only one word, which is, uh, add, which adds nothing to the title. And it can be omitted. Hmm? Omar or Muhammad? So which word here to be omitted? Okay, she live donor? Uh, she live donor? No. Uh, the title should include the 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 patient. So, so if we're uh, just to, to answer live donor, the uh, study, the title should be informative, uh, uh, written in very few words that give idea about the design. And the, in, the, in the title, one of the secrets of the good title is to be attractive or spicy, because attractive title uh, uh, will uh, increase the likelihood of publication of the acceptance of the article. So we should learn how to uh, present our work, okay? So uh, live donor is just the, the criteria of patient including the study, and we should, we should write uh, uh, them in the title. This is a description should be put in mind. Uh, who says prospective? Uh, an old prospective. So why you mention, why you select prospective? Muhammad. اعتقد مش هتفرق يعني سواء بروسبكتيف او يعني ممكن يعني مش هتضيف حاجه للتايتل يعني ممكن نقولها في الـ في الببليكيشن نفسها يعني لا اف اف ذا ممكن راندومايزد مينز راندومايزيشن باي اتسلف از بروسبكتيف سو ذير از نو راندومايز ستادي ان ريتروسبكتيف واي لايك هاو تو ساي ات از راندومايزد ريتروسبكتيف ات از امبوسيبل تو بي لايك ذس so randomized is means a prospective. So I can omit prospective without affecting the value of the title. Okay. This is how we calculate sample size, but I'm not going to uh, bother you by this point. Just to know the power of the study is dependent upon the number of patients included. As we mentioned in observational studies, what are the strengths and the weakness of a randomized control study? Nadine? help uh, just read okay as for the randomized controlled trials the strength of such uh, research is the uh, control for bias what what type of bias is avoided uh, selection bias selection and if it's done by mask and double blind the performance as well bias is and in mm -hmm. are are avoided okay Control over exposure. It is the best, best study to, uh, to prove drug efficacy. Mm -hmm. Okay? Weakness? Uh, it's expensive, uh, it's time consuming, and has ethical consideration. What's meant by ethical consideration? Um, it should like be we ethical. Have, yes? yes? We should not apply harm to the patients. That's so, uh, uh, so just explain in an example what's meant by ethical consideration. As I mentioned in the first, uh, in the first part, Sometimes it's impossible to run a study in a randomized fashion. Suppose that I want to prove that dealing with the patient by human approach, human approach, and nice, and dealing with the patient in a nice way. Can we test it in a randomized control study so we have a group of patients to be dealt with a very nice and a kind way and the other to be uh, dealt with rough? It is impossible to accept this design. Even in dialysis patients, in, uh, if we have patients with end-stage kidney disease, 
هايبر كاليميا اند فوليوم اوفر لود وي كانوت دو رندوماس كنترول ستادي هير بيكوز اتس ان ايثيكال بيكوز اوف وي ران رندوماس كنترول ستادي هير ويل بوت بيشنس ان هارم سو اوف ذا بيشنس ويل بي بوت ان هارم رندومايزيشن شودنت بي دان يس رندومايز ستادي از ذا بيست ستادي بات وي دونت دو ات اند بوت ذا بيشنت ان اني هارم If the study is run, uh, if the if the if uh, like the examples I mentioned, there is a, a name known for the investigator which is Barashot study. Do you know what's meant by Barashot study? Mm -hmm. If if I am in the aircraft, and the captain said we have problem in the engine, the craft will be uh, fired. <laughs> And everyone should have the parachute. Uh, can Toka uh, stop him and saying, what is your evidence? Or you should have the parachute. <laughs> can you say to him, uh, uh, bring it to me. And uh, New England should not have medicine, double blind, placebo, randomized control trial to prove the efficacy and safety of using parachute in the aircrafts. It's impossible. So this is why sometimes we cannot do experimental study and it is enough to uh, follow what we have from the weak, uh, weak uh, observational one because sometimes it's impossible. Even uh, we cannot do randomized control study to prove uh, uh, smoking uh, and lung cancer. It's, it is unethical. So this is our, uh, and we have for randomized control the study, And we learn this by experience and uh, uh, by the days and by the years. We know, is it a good randomized control trial? Does it add to our practice? Or is it just a quack and nothing? So we have a metric method. What's meant by metric method? If I want to know your body weight, I should uh, make a scale to know the body weight or the tab to with circumference, so we should measure, we should have a measure. And in the quality, quality assurance methods, if you can measure anything, you can uh, compare its value. So this is checklist, one of the checklist. We just go to through the checklist and give points, and at the end of the day, you can say it is a very respected study, or it is very bad study, although it is done by randomized control study, but there are many points to be considered. Okay, and this is CASP, and I advise, I suggest all of you to go to Google and write Critical Appraisal Skill Program, CASP, and you will find the list of all studies, and for each study there is a checklist. And when you go through that checklist, you will know uh, and tra uh, train yourself about the how to criticize the studies. Because we shouldn't take it as fact, no facts in medicine and everything is accepted if there is a, a rationale. Uh, so we have checklist to assess all the study design. Then the third type, now I finished observational studies and finished interventional studies. And then the third one is meta-analysis. What's meant by meta-analysis? What's meant by meta-analysis? أنا بجيب كذا ريسيرش بيبر أو كذا ستادي وبعمل لهم ستاتستكس مع بعض كلهم في الآخر وأطلع أطلع بريزلت. Why we think of meta analysis؟ ليه بنعمل الشغلانة دي؟ sample size بتاعي؟ بيرفكت لأنه ساعات it is sometimes I want a powerful study. If I say the intervention costs per patient uh, $10,000. And to prove its efficacy, we should have 10,000 persons. And the lab and the radiology and the follow-up, so the, the, if I do a study, respect the study, it should, uh, we should have money, uh, million dollars. It's, it will be very difficult to run a study by this amount of money. So instead of doing this, we we'll combine the results If suppose that we do a study here at, at Mansoura Urugia Nephro Center and the same design done at uh, Saudi Arabia and other in Japan, in United States, UK, 
and then all these are published already. So uh, uh, in meta-analysis, we don't work with patients. We work with uh, publications. Uh, so we take the publications and we try to mix all the results. As I mentioned the last week, in the, as a blender, a blended method, and at the end of the day, I, I say the value of this intervention is so. Based on this uh, publication, but in each publication, there is a number of patients included. So by this way, I increase the sample size uh, uh, to solve the problem of low-powered, small randomized controlled studies. So meta-analysis, if it is done well, it will be the best level of evidence. So again, zoom meta-analysis is considered the best design uh, or the best to answer a question under research. It is dependent on its composition. If it is composed of well-done studies, it will be very nice. If it is composed of bad studies, it will be rotten. Rotten means uh, 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 facet. Uh, so uh, this is why the, we do meta-analysis by combination information, as Toka mentioned, to increase statistical power uh, of the study design and to elucidate general patterns that we cannot take from single study. Uh, this is how the, the, the methodology is written. You will find in the meta-analysis, there is a critical review for all studies assessing the same point. And then uh, you'll find the, the, this, uh, this uh, meta-analysis, we start with systematic review, or we start with reviewing all literature regarding this point. So we find, for example, thousand article, and then we remove, duplicate, and we use English language, whatever. So this is how it is written. Uh, uh, do you see now the um, uh, PDF, systematic review and meta-analysis? Or you didn't see anything? Um, I شفتوا حاجه دلوقتي؟ اه بس هاي كانت فايل كده باين حاجه دلوقتي؟ السكرين بتاعت هاي باين ازاي البي دي اف اساسا فتحت تقدري تقري الارتكل اللي قدامك دي؟ لا لا لسه ما فتحتش لسه ما فتحتش يبقى انا هقفلها تاني هقفل ده تاني It's okay now? Oh, do, you, do you see? Okay, what is this? This is not a meta-analysis, this is a systematic review. Uh, uh, you should know the difference between systematic review and a regular review. If I say to you, I want uh, any of you to write the uh, psychology of, the page of, the, of uh, doctors in the COVID era, so you will go to the net and look at publications about the, uh, this issue and uh, you can find two articles and write it in a way or another. So this is just a review, simple review. But what's meant by systematic review? Systematic review is a detailed, exhaustive way to mix the data together, but without reanalysis. So it is not a design, it is a review at the end of the day, but it is a structured review. So here, systematic review, has a question. The question in this study is, what are the predictors of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease progression? What's meant by this? If the patient has polycystic kidney disease, uh, and if the kidney will deteriorate, the cyst will grow. So I want to know which uh, are the factors that lead to more and more increase in the uh, cysts and the increase the progression of kidney disease and polycystic kidney disease. Is it a nice question or not? To know the predictors? Um, it, yes. It is very nice and, and if, the, if I am a patient with polycystic kidney, I should know, I want to know, I am eager to know who are, which are the risk factors that uh, increases the rate of progression of my disease. And if I know the risk factors, I can reduce them 
trying to reduce the progression of the disease. I'm not uh, bothering you by the scientific contents, but I want you to just look at this. Can you see this table? Yes. Can you read it? The summary of systematic review process. H how many? Um, for the first step, it was 2,056 citations. So 2,056 citation, and this is the period as I, uh, and, and so they reviewed everything until uh, the, 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 the time of publication of 2013. So 2,056 citation, and then they apply scientific way, review abstracts or met articles or not dealing with factors because sometimes when we read the abstracts, we assume that this is within the domain. And then when we go in details, we find it's, uh, it is, it is nothing. And sometimes we have duplicate. So when they apply the process, at the end of the day, what they have? 666. So this is the systematic review uh, giving you the juice of 666 articles in, one, in, in how many pages? In 20 pages. So if I read these 20 pages, like I read 666 articles. This is the, what's meant by systematic review. It's an exhaustive way. It has flow, and the flow is expressed. But I, I, I want just to show you how, at the end of the day, they can represent. So they have tables and discussing different points. And at the end of the day, if you have this figure, look at this figure. Do you see the figure? So they reviewed everything about the uh, factors that may predict the progression of polycystic kidney disease. And they classify factors in clinical predictors, laboratory predictor, genetic, imaging, and environmental predictor. If I say to the patient, if you increase the coffee drinking, and by, this, by the way, from nephrology point of view, coffee is protective for the kidney. So if I go to the television, and saying what is the effect of coffee on kidney, it protects kidney disease, reduces CKD progression, with the exception of polycystic kidney disease. Why? Because coffee includes adenosine, which increases the, uh, the cyst growth. So all kidney diseases can get the benefit of coffee with the exception of polycystic kidney disease. So this, is it a good news or bad news? I, I, don't, I don't mean good and bad. I, I mean it is important or not to know this lifestyle is associated with the problem here. Is it? Yes. It's this is very valid. So if you, at the end of this article, you memorize this figure, to, it will answer the question, what are the predictors of progression of the disease from all these different factors? If I read it and it, it is published, for example, today, then this is the end, the cut edge of information. So it is very nice. So systematic review means we are following in depth all publications and applying systematic way uh, and diagram, follow, uh, follow a chart to know uh, the uh, good studies and then tabulated in a very nice way. So this is the beauty of systematic review. But is there any analysis, reanalysis? Is there any combination of analysis? Nothing. Mm -hmm. It is just tabulation and uh, description and harvest of information from the articles and, and no reanalysis. So it is not meta-analysis. It is systematic review. Okay. So what is meta-analysis? I'm going to share with you because it is important to uh, under to, to just to see these. Where, where we are. Where is the second file? Did you see any PDF now? Do you see any PDF? Effect of lower No, no, no. Hi. هو ساعات بيعلق شوية في الترانزيشنز دي بس. اه هنزله هو وافتحه تاني. 
مش راضي يجي مش راضي يجي في البتاع اللي اوبتمايز اهو شفتوها كده دلوقتي اه كان يو ريد ذا تايتل Effects of lowering the dial dialysate temperature in chronic hemodialysis: a systematic review and meta-analysis. Usually, meta-analysis starts with systematic review. So they have question here, and then, as as I mentioned in in systematic review, you will find this prisma or flow chart. So this is the the number of publications, and then the process of scientific process. So this is known as flow chart or prisma. Prefer the reporting item for systematic review and meta analysis. So the the starting points is to look at the all the data, and then in meta analysis here, we should look at studies that can be combined together because we will do re analysis or combination analysis for these studies, and the results. Of the meta-analysis is expressed in forest plot. So, if I ask you, you a question, a simple question, how to present meta-analysis is by forest plot. Forest, forest plot. It, this is the how uh, forest plot uh, uh, appears. So, what? What is the composition of forest plot? Because I want all of you, when you find any meta-analysis, uh, to understand what's meant by this figure. Just looking at this figure, you get it. Here, this is the question. Effect of low temperature dialysis on intradialytic hypotension. So the, the intervention here is, Nadine, the which intervention here is followed? Um, the effect of low temperature? Yes, so, so we have patients who are dialyzed by traditional way and the patients who are dialyzed with low temperature dialysate. Usually if we reduce temperature of the dialysate by half degree, just half degree below the core temperature. So the intervention here is cooling of dialysate. And the outcome is, or primary end point is, Occurrence of intradialytic hypotension because hypotension in during dialysis session is the most important uh, complication we encountered in dialysis. So is there an intervention to reduce uh, the incidence of intradialytic hypotension? This is one of the proposed modalities is to reduce the temperature of dialysate. Okay, what is the result of this meta-analysis? Before I speak the end result of the meta-analysis. Look here. What is this? I want you, uh, Toka and Nadine, to speak with me. What is this? Um, the source. Each, each row reflects one publication. So mm -hmm. here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve studies included. Uh, sorry, eleven studies included. This is the number, the name of the first author, and this is the year of publication. Mm -hmm. And here, the intervention fixed 35 degree versus normal one. And this is the, the, the cold dialysate number and the standard dialysate number. Okay, and mm -hmm. here, the, uh, the, here, the risk is here, the uh, addressing the uh, odds ratio or relative risk, whatever, here, the rate ratio. It is one. What's meant by one? Mm, no sure. difference. No difference. Mm -hmm. So uh, to know the no difference, we, I, I'm going to the second component of the meta-analysis. So the first component is multiple rows. Each row reflects one study, okay? Mm -hmm. And each row, uh, have has its results expressed in, in one in the, in the square. So the square, do you see this square? Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is square and this is square and this is square, you find here different sizes of square. So the first point 
the size of a square, what is the value of size of square? Just looking at this figure, you will say this study is, includes a bigger number of patients because the square is fatty than this. Uh, so the number of patients in this study significant, it's, it seems that it like all these three studies. So the weight of this study will be higher. If you look at the number of patients including HR, you will find approximate 100 in HR. But here 30, uh, 24, okay. So you, the bigger the square, the larger the number of patients included in the study. Site of a square is the result of each individual study. So if we go to the first one, here the square is on the vertical line. Vertical line is the line of one. If the square is on the vertical line, this means it cuts the line of no difference. So this is one of important points to know. If the square cuts the vertical line, this means that there, in this study, there is no difference between intervention and control. Am I clear? So is it only the square? Because here the square doesn't cut the vertical line. It in, it does, uh, the result here is significant? Yes or no, Nadine? Um, no, not The square, square doesn't cross, doesn't cut the, uh, the line, the vertical mm -hmm. line. This is a line of insignificant difference. Mm -hmm. But to say this study is significant, both square and transverse line should be on one side. If the okay. straight line, horizontal line, cuts the vertical line, this means this study is insignificant. What this straight horizontal line, it is a confidence interval. Do you remember that uh, when I say if it cut one, this means if it is below and above one, this means the study is insignificant. So mm -hmm. to say the individual study is significant, both square and the horizontal line should be away from the vertical line, like this study. Do you see this square? Yes. In this study, this is the, uh, 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 the uh, relative risk or ratio of the intraanalytic hypotension. It is less than one or above one? Uh, less than one. Less than one. This means the intervention is beneficial in reducing hypotension in this one, in this study. So this is insignificant, 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 and here significant reduction. Here significant reduction. But I want to ask you a question, and I prefer if Dr. Hani would ask to answer this question. Dr. Hani, Hani Mansour. Yes, uh, If I ask you, because this is a, a, a technical question, do you see this? Study the horizontal, yes. line, the horizontal line is short, is this, yes, and short, yes. It, and here it is long, which is more superior. The sh both of them are significant because both of them, uh, the square, not cutting, has, not cutting, and the, the horizontal line. don't cut the, the vertical line. But what is the difference between short confidence and long confidence? In, in, so which is better? This short. I think the short, the shorter one. The shorter the confidence, the more the precise the results. So although it is here, it is significant, uh, low high potential, but uh, confidence is not good like this. So if you combine all these together, you will find the diamond. I should mute uh, Dr. Hani. So again, uh, do, do you uh, concentrate Nadine and the Toka and the all? Yeah. Uh, so the composition of meta-analysis starts with systematic review and then selecting studies that can be combined in a statistical way. Studies are expressed each study in one line. And we have the secret uh, is a vertical line. And this uh, vertical line is the line of insignificant difference. If the square and the horizontal line 
uh, are uh, uh, distributed among the two parts, the two uh, sides of the vertical line. This means they cut the vertical line. This, the, this study is insignificant. The square uh, denotes the result of each study. Size of a square denotes the number of patients included. So the more the fat is a square, the larger the number of patients included in the study. So what is the, the result of meta-analysis? Toka. Um, is it in square, vertical, horizontal, or is there any in else here? Do you see this diamond? Yes. So diamond is the, is the end result of all studies. So I combine here 60 patients to 24 patients, 200 patients, whatever the number here. So the number increased from 100 to 300, for example. So this is quite larger number included in the meta-analysis. And I want to, to, uh, to know an answer. Does cooling of the lysate reduce uh, intradialytic hypotension? Where is the diamond here, Toka? Uh, the side of cooling analysis. Does it cut the vertical line? No. So is it lower, less than one or above one? Uh, less than one. And, and uh, this is, uh, if, you, if you read, it's favor called dialysis. Even if it, if it is not written favoring, if it is less than one, it is beneficial. So long as we are addressing the effect because this reflects the efficacy, total efficacy. So total efficacy, the hypotension is less than one. This means that the intervention is beneficial in reducing the hypotension. Do you get it? Yes. So meta-analysis, which type of this meta, which type of this figure, uh, you know, forest plot, forest plot. The square, side of a square denotes the result. The horizontal limb is a confidence interval. Uh, to say it is significant should be away from the vertical line, both the square and the horizontal line. The results of meta-analysis is not in the square, it is in the diamond. If the diamond is in, two, on one side, I should see the side, which, which this side means. If it is here, this means the intervention is beneficial. If it is here, means the hypotension is more common, the intervention is bad. This is how we interpret the figure. Now, if you see the figure, you will understand it, Nadine and the Toka and all the students. I think, yes. I think it is uh, very nice uh, for you. So I stop share here and continue with the slides. I know it is long uh, presentation, but uh, um, just to uh, try to... What is the critical appraisal? Because we are accustomed in this presentation to say strength and weakness for each thing. But before saying advantages and disadvantages of meta-analysis, you should know that the question of meta-analysis determine the type of studies to be included. What is meant by this? If the meta-analysis is to assess drug efficacy, suppose that I want to know the value, the efficacy and safety of interleukin-2 receptor antagonists in kidney transplantation, this is a drug or not? Drug efficacy or not, Nadine? Uh, yes. So if I don't have a, a powerful randomized control study and I want to combine the results of different studies, I should combine randomized control study or observational studies? Uh, randomized control study. Why? Because because the, the best study to prove drug efficacy is randomized control study. Mm -hmm. so for, to respect meta-analysis, it should be it should include all, all studies included should be randomized controlled study. Suppose that we find a mix, randomized and observational study. We say this is one of the weakness of this meta-analysis. It combines good and the bad studies, small studies. So this, we should put in mind that meta-analysis is dependent on composition. The number one, if the question is drug efficacy, the composed studies should be randomized controlled study. If it is not like this, it is a weakness point. Number two, if the meta-analysis to uh, evaluate diagnostic tool, which designs to be included in the meta-analysis, should be a randomized control study? No. Uh, for 
for diagnosis, cross-sectional studies are okay. So if I want to uh, approve diagnostic facility, so I combine all cross-sectional studies because cross-sectional study, the study uh, addressing the incidence, prevalence, uh, and uh, focus on diagnosis. Third one, if I want to do analysis for harm, which designs to be included in the study? Toka. Um, randomized control. So to, to respect meta-analysis, proving harm should include randomized control study? Um, cohort, cohort study. If I want to say uh, smoking and lung cancer, uh, I should combine uh, randomized control study, it is impossible. Uh, a cohort. cohort or case control study, they are perfect. So the question, uh, it is not here, but uh, you will find it in the video. Uh, to prove harm, you will find randomized control study is superior to cohort, superior to case control. If randomized, if randomized control study is superior, uh, should we do meta-analysis by randomized control study? Because this was, this was a question of one of the medical students the first year, last year. The, uh, the, she asked me, when she reviewed the video, she said to me, you uh, told us in the lecture that to prove harm to, uh, by meta-analysis, just include the, uh, cohort and case control. And in the video, there is a slide, you write in the harm, Randomized control trial is superior to cohort and the case control. The which, the which is the right? Oh, that's so early. I can't see that video. Randomized control. This was a question for the first year student. What is the answer? The, the answer is, I think it's cohort. Uh, yeah, randomization, uh, he went, uh, intentionally, uh, shukran, shukran, intentionally, if I want to prove harm, I combine the results of cohort and the case control. But suppose that I run randomized control the trial, and the randomized control trial revealed harm. We do the we do randomized control study to prove efficacy or to prove harm. Efficacy. Hmm? Efficacy. But we don't find the efficacy. We don't find toxicity. We find harm. So harm proven by a randomized control study is superior to any harm proven by the observational study because randomized is superior. Do you get it now? So I don't intendly, intend, intend to do a randomized control study for harm. But if the harm is proven by randomized control, the study should be, a, should be a, a superior to any observational study. And the, as I mentioned in the double blind randomized control study, if the side effects and mortality are in the, in the active intervention, this is a nail in the coffin, Musmar Finash intervention, because this is, was a critical proven of harm, because interventional studies are superior to observation. The problem in the harm, we shouldn't do intentionally studies to prove harm. But if it is done, if it is done by chance in a study to prove efficacy and we find in the randomized control study a harm, it's, it's okay, it is, this is a harm. Do you get it now? And I, I have in a Arabic, question. In Arabic, in the Arabic. I don't do a randomized control study to prove harm. Because if I know that there is a harm, there will be an ethical problem here. لكن افرض انا عملت راندومايز كنترول ستادي علشان اطلع افكاسي طلعت لي هارم خلاص الانترفنشن ده بقى هارمفول بروفن باي انترفنشن ستادي مش هقول بقى اعمل لي بقى كوهورت ستادي ورين الهارم هو طلع في انترفنشن فهمتوا فهمتوا يبقى في الميتا اناليسيس لما باجي اعمل الهارم بجمع الكوهورت والكيس كنترول ستادي اند ذير از ا فيموس كوهورت ستادي كوريليتنج the harm, uh, the, uh, the, occur the association of uh, myocardial ischemia with urinary stones. So they combined the results of six cohort studies and they found that uh, urinary stones is considered a non-traditional risk factor for coronary heart disease based on multiple cohort studies. 
combined together meta analysis so again the composition of meta analysis determine its superiority number two composition of meta analysis is dependent on its aim if the aim is to prove drug efficacy i should combine randomized control study if the aim to prove a diagnosis cross sectional studies if the aim is to do harm is to prove harm case controls and cohort studies are okay and if there is by the way in while we are searching there is a study randomized to proven harm i can include it in this meta analysis but it's not necessarily to search for randomized control study to prove harm your question yani satisfied oh okay so the uh, so this is what i want to, to i'm not going to 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 say uh, the network meta analysis for you is, so what are the disadvantages so the advantage of, of meta advantages of meta analysis it is a way to combine results to give high powerful uh, answer because it may be very difficult to run a powerful single randomized control study but the problem is we can give attention to low quality studies the composition is bad uh, uh, too dependent on published results because there is a tendency in journals to accept the positive results and they decline usually decline negative results sometimes there is heterogeneity to combine if i want to say i have 10 oranges should i combine five oranges and five apples or i should combine five oranges and five oranges oranges no. oranges so if i bought orange plus apple plus ta'amiya uh, it will be a mix so mixing apple and the green means uh, orange means that we are dependent on heterogeneous studies the study design is not similar population are dif different or the methodology is different so this is this means heterogeneity covering multiple results derived from same studies okay so it is it is very important to know what's meant by heterogeneity and we should search for heterogeneity heterogeneity means that meta analysis is poor or not poor it is point of weakness how to test meta analysis heterogeneity is by looking at i to the power of 2 i is 2 to i to the power of 2 is an index of heterogeneity uh, this is this is one example of meta analysis do you see the diamond here diamond yes. here is in this side here the line of indifference is zero so if it is by minus this means that it is beneficial if it is above zero means harmful because it is away completely away from the vertical line but look here i to the power of two is 91 percent it it should be near zero to say that we combine homogeneous studies so to know heterogeneity look at i to the power of two if it is above 30 percent 40 50 percent this means the heterogeneity is high so there is a scale the nearer to zero the better the, homo the, the homogeneous the studies included are. So how to know heterogeneity? Uh, just by uh, not the side of the diamond, but to the i to the power of two. If it's zero or near zero, zero, 10%, 20% is okay, fine. Homogeneous studies. I mix orange with orange. But if it is nine to one percent, here th there is a big problem in these studies of heterogeneous studies. In comparison to this one, diamond here is away from the vertical line, so it's significant lower. But look at i to the power of two, which is? Zero percent. What's meant by zero percent i to the power of two? Completely It is no heterogeneity. All, all the studies included are homogeneous. And this gives the uh, the respect to the meta analysis so this is one of the strong point is to know that we are mixing homogeneous studies together this the this i think this is the last point in the meta analysis uh, as i mentioned uh, publication bias because journals usually accept uh, certain results so if we review the all publications and then 
we uh, make this plot. This plot is known as funnel plot. If the results are distributed like this fashion, this is vertical one, and all uh, the results are uh, homogeneous between the two aspects, this means that they are symmetrical. So if the funnel plot is symmetrical, this means no publication bias. So uh, how to test for publication bias is by funnel plot. And funnel, symmetrical funnel plot means no publication bias. And this is a symmetrical plot. The results are on one side. This means publication bias. So how to, how to know heterogeneity? By high level of i to the power of two. How to know publication bias? By a symmetrical funnel plot. So forest plot is the figure of meta-analysis and the funnel plot is the figure of publication bias. So to conclude meta-analysis, meta-analysis is the best study design or the best study to answer a question if it, is, if it includes well done, high quality studies, if it, in, if it includes homogeneous studies, if there is no publication bias, if there is adequate endpoints, if there is optimal statistical adjustment for each study included. But meta-analysis is bad, Yes, we take it as an evidence, but not strong evidence. Uh, if the studies included are poor, heterogeneous studies with publication bias, inadequate endpoints, and suboptimal statistical power. I think we should stop here, Nadine. To stop here and, and to, uh, to yani, I promise to have another session, um, maybe in Ramadan, according to your time, so you can arrange and write on the WhatsApp group. Uh, because we have still we have important data uh, to know. But before closing this presentation, why mm -hmm. we take all this very long time for the design of the studies uh, to know the hierarchy. Do you know what's meant by hierarchy of evidence? Like yani hierarchy. Levels? Hierarchy, what does it mean? Levels? Hierarchy means harami. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the top of the pyramid يعني الرئيس هو الأعلى وبعدين بينزل أقل منه في المراتب لغاية ما يوصل لعامة الشعب في تحت تمام؟ ف the best study design it is in the top of the evidence so it, it, it is the top of the pyramid the top of the pyramid reflects strongest evidence so if we have a strong well done meta analysis dependent on large randomized control study this is the strongest evidence that we can have in medicine Okay, followed by large multi-center randomized control study. Because large multi-center randomized control study is superior to poor meta-analysis. Followed by meta-analysis of a small randomized control trial. Followed by single center randomized control trial. So this is, this is within the domain of interventional studies. Followed by observational studies. So all observational studies uh, carry uh, uh, low level of evidence and they create hypothesis that can be tested in interventional one. And the bottom of evidence-based medicine is dependent on the experience of my professor or animal research. So it, it just bought a question to be tested in human study, animal research, but it's good to st uh, start with no, run, no studies in human except if the drug is tested in animal first. And the, if we don't have anything except the experience of my professor, should I respect? Yes, I should respect the expert opinion so long as I don't have another opinion based on a study done. Last point, even in observational studies, is there a difference between case control, cross-section, or cohort study? Which is better? Although the evidence is low, which is the law which is better, superior in the observation category. Look at this study. This is a study that correlates to protein intake with kidney function. So what they do, we have to group of persons eating heavy meat and eating uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, 
and then assess GFR at one point of time in a cross-sectional study. So if, uh, if we do cross-sectional study, and then we find persons who are eating heavy meat have higher GFR. What does it mean? Eating heavy protein is associated with uh, uh, higher kidney function or better kidney function. But both groups are followed longitudinally in cohort fashion, cohort study, for 11 years. At the end of the 11 years, GFR, glomerular filtration rate of heavy protein uh, consumers, were found to be low than, lower than low, low protein intake. So we have cross-section at the beginning confirming that a high protein is associated with good kidney function. But at the end of follow-up, high protein is associated with lower kidney function. Should I accept the cross-sectional or longitudinal study? Longitudinal. So longitudinal study is the best because it is observational, prospective study. This is why we should be careful about the design that we look at. Uh, this is one of the studies when I was in the United States, and in this observational studies, the authors of this article, and uh, they uh, wrote my name with, uh, for, with them, the evaluation of fluoroquinolone for prevention of virus, BK virus after kidney transplantation. They observed it in an observational study because they measure the virus, and they found category of patients who were sensitive, hypersensitive to sulfur because we usually we give uh, septirine or uh, septazole for six months after transplantation. Here they found some of patients are allergic. So they shifted to quinolones. And by monitoring the level of the virus, they found the quinolone groups were associated with no viremia. Does it mean that fluoroquinolone is protective against this virus? According to this observation study, yes. But what happened? after I uh, come back, after uh, uh, to, to Egypt, they ran a randomized control study and they found no difference. No difference between uh, fluoroquinolone users and non-fluoroquinolone uh, users regarding the uh, BK virus. This means that in observational study, you may find results that is not proven in interventional study. This is why observational studies are hypothesis generating studies to be tested in an interventional way. Um, uh, in the next time, I'll explain to you the guidelines, but I would like to uh, end this uh, session by this uh, photo. This is the, the photo of 32 students, 30 from Mansoura Medical School and from Etnin uh, Min Asnan. Uh, 30 medical students are among the Manchester group and non and the conventional group. Here you can see uh, Sharif, uh, I, I think you can know some of them, Nadine and uh, Toka. Do you know some of them? Uh, Sharif Shawar and Salma Ismail, Muataz Zilidia. All these students participate in active research. All of them present their work in international conferences. And moreover, eight publications, uh, eight articles were written and they uh, participate actively in these articles and they were published in, 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 in international journal. I hope that, uh, uh, and this is uh, some of the students, and this is Sharif Shawar. I, I, I am, I'm going to end with this slide. Can you read it, Nadine? Um, the certificate? Yes. <clears throat> okay, this is to certify that Sharif Mahmoud Shawar, a medical student in year six, Mansoura Manchester Program for Medical Education, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University, has actively participated as a trainer in conducting the research methodology and statistics course from the 31st of October to the 30th of November 2011 through mastering the techniques of renal ischemia reperfusion injury, nephrectomy, ophorectomy, or cadectomy in rats. We appreciate his sincere efforts in transferring his experience to junior college. So this is a student, while he's a student, who mastered a technique uh, based on a study. We did, did interventional study in animal and he mastered or freak to me and or to me. He came to me by an idea that he found that acute kidney injury is less severe in females. So I asked him, why Sharif? Why do you expect that females, are, uh, the injury of the kidney is less in females than males? He said to me, this is because of estrogen. Females has estrogen, estrogen may be nephroprotective. So I said to him, why 
you cannot see the reverse. Maybe testosterone is, is bad hormone. This is why we expose the rats into two techniques, orchidectomy and ophrectomy, and giving them testosterone and estrogen to test the hypothesis. Uh, uh, but what, why I insisted on this certificate, this is just to say active students uh, will um, harvest his activity. يعني وما نايل المطالب بالتمني ولكن تؤخذ الدنيا غلاب يعني الجهد اللي بيزرع من زرع حصل واللي بيشتغل بجدية ربنا سبحانه وتعالى بيكرمه وإلى هنا هتوقف ولو لكم أي سؤال أنا تحت أمركم أنت عارفين شريف فينيشد هيز ريزيدنس إن مانشستر يونيفرستي نعم وعمر الليثي ان ذا واز ذا نمبر 1 ان ذا توب اوف ذا فيرست باتش فينيشد هيز ريزيدنسي اور ان نيورولوجي ان ذا ستيتس سو ذيس از اي اي لاف بوث اوف ذيم فيري ماتش بيكوز ذي وير هارد اي ام فيري براود باي ذيم سو اي هوبينج يو اول ذا بيست اند اف يو هاف اني كويشن بليز دونت هيزيتيت تو كونتاكت مي اند اي ام ويتينج ذا ذات يو ويل اجري and contact me to meet again because still we have uh, more one session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Dr.